Well, hi, everybody. Welcome to the Kinexus Continuous Improvement Podcast. I'm Mark Raven, a senior advisor with Kinexus, and we are joined by... Greg Jacobson. I'm the CEO and co-founder. So, Greg, um, it's always good to talk to you. It's a little bit of a, a somber topic today. We wanted to um, you know, acknowledge and, and pay tribute uh, to a friend and colleague of ours who, uh, who passed away recently, um, Chris Burnham. Um, we've our, our friend and colleague Jeff Roussel wrote about Chris on the Kinexus blog. I've written about Chris um, at leanblog.org, but you know, uh, Greg and I both wanted to share um, some thoughts and, 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 and try to celebrate Chris beyond um, remembering him. He passed away recently. Um, after a brief illness, and it's it's still, you know, I think it's just, it's hard, so. Um. Yeah, it, it's certainly quite fresh and, and still raw and uh, somewhat unbelievable when someone passes uh, an untimely, um, in an untimely way, and so you are still kind of looking around going, wait, is he going to join the next... Uh, you know, Google Meet or walk in the door. And, um, you know, obviously intellectually you realize not, but emotionally it's hard to come to. And uh, I'm, I'm glad you you had a, a really good observation, Mark. You said, hey, did, uh, you may not know this, but I, I was the first episode of, of Chris's of Chris's podcast. So tell the, tell the story that kind of led to us um, thinking about um, doing this as a as a podcast and um, yeah. really as a way to pay tribute to Chris. Yeah. Um, so yeah, Chris had in, invited me to be the first guest on his podcast, the lean leadership podcast, as he called it. Um, this was early 2015. You know, I was honored that, that he reached out to me um, to do that. And I found the, the email he had sent me back then email is forever and he had sent a list of questions. I mean, Chris was passionate about lean. He was organized. He always had uh, things in a row. So he had sent a list of interview questions, uh, a list of what he called some hot seat segment questions. I don't think we're going to be able to get through all of those. But, you know, as Greg and I continue doing podcasts and ask us every, anything sessions, I think we'll incorporate some of those questions uh, from Chris. Um, you know, so that, that was how, and when I first met Chris, but then Greg, maybe you can tell some of the story of not only you being a guest on his podcast, but Chris kind of getting into the Kinexus fold in two different ways. Yeah. And I was Chris's 15th or 16th episode. It was, you know, I never enjoy listening to myself talk, but it yeah. was a lot of fun going back and, and re-listening to that episode and remembering that time that time with him. What's interesting, Mark, is Chris tried to bring us in a couple different times, tried to bring Kinex a couple different times. And uh, every the- every Into time, the company he was working with. Then. Into the company he was working with. And, and the stars really aligned when he was um, at, uh, at Stryker. And um, I'm, I'm just drawing a blank, and this is where I told you, Mark, that I, I had worked a night shift, and my brain wasn't going to be completely. I'm, I'm drawing a blank on where he, where what, what it was before Stryker. Um, uh, right Medical. Right. Thank you. Yeah. Um, um, when he was at Right before Stryker had had purchased him, and uh, um, we got the opportunity to to work with him, and, and he was one of our our greatest champions. Did such a, a great job deploying um, kind access throughout. I mean. Right in its own world was a, a very it was a multi billion dollar organization before it was acquired. So, um, and then and then through the acquisition, um, he was a casualty, so to speak. That's probably not the best word to use um, in in his remembrance. But um, he he became a free agent, if you will, mm -hmm. and that's probably a better a better term. And he he reached out to us. We from time to time we know different um, job openings in the continuous improvement space, and so he reached out and. We got to thinking that, that we have a lot of software development expertise. We have a lot of um, software sales, software um, implementation, and uh, we 
are fortunate enough to get to work with you on a part-time basis, Mark, but you know, what if we brought someone into Kinexus um, that has had the experience of using Kinexus and has 15, 20 years plus of lean experience, what would a person like that look like on the Kinexus team? And so we were able to really open up a new division, that one that quite frankly now I can't even imagine not having as it just becomes so integral to what we do. And so he was our first lean strategist uh -huh. um, back in the pandemic era, I wanna say 2021, so. Uh -huh. I think so. Yeah, it's funny, I mean, I had always enjoyed opportunities to cross paths with Chris when he would come to the Kinexus user conference, AKA Kinexicon. Really enjoyed talking with Chris during the session, going out, having a bourbon together uh, in, in the evening. Um, he was, he was uh, a lot of fun and, and to talk shop and to get to know him a little bit personally and, and, and talk about passions around sports and, and other things. You know, that was sort of like, at least for me, kind of the second phase of like knowing Chris, the podcaster, Chris, the kind of his customer. And then, you know, I was really excited when he came on board um, at Kinexus and, you know, started building a team, you know, with uh, Linda and Stephanie working with him in the lean strategy team. You know, Chris was um, a, a leader. And I think you probably had more exposure to that leadership, Greg, you know, you were leading him. You saw how Chris was leading too. Yeah, no, I don't know if uh, if I was leading him or he was leading me. Sometimes it, it felt like a little bit of both, but yeah, no, Chris became sure. part of the, the executive leadership team here at Kinexus. And it's, I don't know if it was apropos, if there was uh, some kind of force that aligned this, but I started to listen to a new book um, and it's called Humor Seriously. Uh -huh. And uh, uh, unfortunately, the what I'm looking at um, is to, oh Jennifer Acker and Naomi Begonas. I'm unfortunately my I'm, my my eyes are are, are are failing me in in being able to see the exact authors. But I bring it up because it's it's really talking about the importance of humor in a professional and a business setting. And that is something that uh, you you didn't meet Chris and, and realize it after a, a few minutes. You realize just just how large of a life his personality was and, and just how truly funny he was. He was one of the funniest people I've had the pleasure of working with. And I've here at Kinex has worked with a lot of really funny people. And right. um, and Chris was right there amongst them all. And I mean, one way I mean, we're very often remembering Chris and we'll, we'll continue to do so. But, you know, Chris uh, at the beginning of the weekly Friday Kinexus team meetings had like to throw in a dad joke. He, he often liked to throw in dad jokes and, and kind of along, you know, the word of the day, we were adding in, hey, you know, somebody share a Chris Burnham dad joke of the week. I know he... Yeah. He would do so many funny things. He would, if you if you walked away from your screen, because um, he lived in Memphis and the Kinexus team is scattered throughout the U.S. If you'd walk away from your screen, he would take your background and then he would make it your background. So it would look like he was uh, standing with you in, yeah. in the office or the uh, or or in your your home office, whichever it was, and just so many funny things that he did. So I think it's only. Uh, it's only appropriate that we honor him with a dad joke of the week. I just did a, a quick Google search because I'm not, I don't have a lot of dad jokes on the, off the top of my head, but maybe this counts as an example because Chris appreciated manufacturing. Greg, what would you call an adequate manufacturing plant? I don't know, Mark, what would you call an adequate manufacturing plant? A satisfactory. <laughs> <laughs> is that a dad joke or is that just a bad joke? Nah, it's kind of a dad joke, yeah. <laughs> but that play on words, I guess, that goes with uh, a dad joke. But um, yeah, <laughs> have to try. But yeah, um, it's it's uh, it's a loss. Not just the jokes, not just the the bourbon talk, the basketball talk. Um, 
it's quite a loss. So, you know, if any of uh, Chris's friends or family are listening, um, you know, of course, we, we continue to extend our deepest condolences. And, you know, we had gotten together as a Kinexus team the week after he passed. Um, you know, and the stories that were being told, you know, from a workplace context were very similar to the types of stories that we heard in Memphis a couple of weeks back. It's going to speak, so I think, the, to the, the consistency and the character of Chris. I think that what he taught me, at least or what I learned about him after his passing, was just how many deep connections he had made. So mm -hmm. I think that's probably a good, a good lesson for leaders in general. Um, he extended well beyond um, direct reports and in his division. He really reached out to people, and I think he was a great mentor um, to to people in kind of helping them advance their careers. And uh, it was very clear he did that um, unselfishly. He was right. he was really just trying to, I think, be a lean leader as his podcast was talking about. And he really um, took those sentiments to heart and he practiced it um, day in and day out. And quite frankly, I mean, he technically reported me. I, I had no idea he was doing so many one-on-ones and mentoring so many different people um, throughout Kinexus. It was uh, it was a pleasure to hear everyone's um, connection to him and um, and how much he was helping them. Yeah, a lot of one-on-one -on -one meetings uh, with people, and you know, we heard you know people sharing their stories of of Chris found a way of connecting with those individuals in a way that that was very, I think, unique. Sin sincere and personalized, right? It wasn't always about what Chris wanted to connect on. Like, I think he was really good at finding the interest or, or what it was with that other person um, and connecting with them instead of like force fitting them connecting with him. You know what I mean? Like, like that he had a real knack for um, finding those connection points. Because, I mean, he, he and I love talking about bourbon, but we know there are some people on the team who wouldn't want to talk about that at all. And right. I think that's, like, to me, part of that example of his interest in others and not making it all about him and what he needed to talk about, you know? Right. He was, uh, the I, I'm thinking from the lean perspective of the the supplier you know, always providing the the information or the the product in the way that the receiver or the customer right. um, takes it. And so, so for instance, for me, I never once talked to him about bourbon, but we talked about podcasts <laughs> all the time. Right. And so, um, yeah, I just, he he never missed a beat. He was always sending me really cool ones, you know, every week or so. And so he was uh, the, his capacity to know a lot about a whole bunch of different subjects was was really remarkable yeah so i think you know his his curiosity is a good trait for a podcast host do you want to do you want to go through at least a couple of the hot seat questions Let's do it. yeah i love it yeah that so just just to remind everyone these were the questions right. that he sent uh mark to i don't even know if uh did he send them to you? I don't know. I mean, I'm trying to remember. I, I don't I wonder, know. Um, I wonder how that list, how that standard work might have evolved over time. You know? Yeah, like these do look familiar. Let's just go ahead and give it a shot and see where, see where the We'd have to go back through other episodes and, yeah. and see, was he asking the same question? So I'm going to throw this one at you, Greg. I'll, I'll take a stab at answering too. Um, and, and it's funny, before I read the question, like I, you know, I think of Chris as being a very positive person in a way that I am sometimes not, you know, like to where I might see the problem, Chris would see the possibility, you know, I mean, I just, uh, and, and, and I appreciated that, like in talking with them, you know, occasionally about Kinexus stuff or lean challenges, like mm -hmm. that's a good reminder there, focus on the possibility, not just the problem. So this first question though, has a little bit of a, um, a not as positive slant. Do you have a lean or continuous improvement pet peeve? Or what do you frequently see being applied or being done wrong? Well, I, I'm, I don't know if I have a pet peeve about this, but I, I do get frustrated sometimes when, and now Mark, and 
you wrote a book on the subject. So um, you're the one that taught me about run charts uh -huh. and, or process behavior charts. And right. I have learned a lot about not being reactionary to a data point, but really looking for trends or being able to differentiate signal from static. And so sometimes I get a little annoyed when people are not necessarily kind of applying that scientific rigor to something that a run chart would be a really great use for. So right. if I had to, that's the first thing that comes to mind. And, um, and I uh, just, uh, I think your, your book's measures of success was the one that kind of taught me that um, and, and kind of went through the rules in a non-statistical way that it made it accessible to an average person. So, Well, there's the possibility of we could use process behavior charts to, to not react to every up and down. Right. Yeah, there's a problem there. Um, so maybe not surprisingly, boy, I, I have pet peeves. <laughs> <laughs> not to be just negative about it, but like the one that comes to mind is in the context of people describing Lean Six Sigma. Mm -hmm. And what I'm saying here is not a criticism of Six Sigma, but it's sometimes in the mashing together of the two. When, when people write or say, Lean is for speed, Six Sigma is for quality. Mm. I'm like, well, Lean is also for quality. You know, the, the, the two pillars of the Toyota production system are um, just in time or flow, which is different than, well, it might be an element of speed and the flow. And then the second pillar is Jidoka or built-in quality, like, hello, mm -hmm. right? So there's this kind of, this false dichotomy of um, Lean and Six Sigma. And again, I'm not saying they can't be combined, but yeah, Lean is also for quality. So it's like nails on the chalkboard if I hear people saying otherwise. I thought you were going to go with, you know, lean is for eliminating waste. And um, I think if you were going to, I mean, that would be a good question. How would you describe lean in, in yeah. three or five words or one sentence? That isn't yeah. a horribly long run on sentence. Sure. I mean, you know, eliminating waste is is part of it. But I mean, I, I, I think it's more broadly, um, you know, this, this focus of um, on continuous improvement mm -hmm. and respect for people. Right? Right. Those are the two pillars of the quote unquote Toyota way. So we've got two pillars of TPS, two pillars of the Toyota way. Um, it's all interrelated. You know, you can think about um, a whole set of principles and mindsets that you might use to describe lean or the the Toyota production system, but um, you know, eliminating waste is one aspect of continuous improvement. But we also then focus on the customer and make sure we're um, providing the right value right. to the customer, right? So customer focus, making sure you're solving the customer's problem with your product or solution. Make sure you understand the customer's need and use of that product and service that, that that goes far beyond like if somebody were to say oh lean is all about reducing waste right right well that's it's not all about how literally do we take that now like a, a good friend of mine david meyer who's a former toyota leader um is quite often says uh you know tps or lean is it's all about problem solving hmm. like I'd, I'd be more willing to to take that right you'd step back and say it's business right. problem solving what, what are our challenges? What are our possibilities? What are we trying to do? And then you keep breaking that problem down into yeah, kind of like smaller, right. more specific problems. And the best way to problem solve would be to allow the people that do the work to be involved in solving the work, which would show respect for people. Uh -huh. The best way to problem solve then would be to understand scientific process and problem solving or some kind of rigor, scientific rigor and problem solving. So yeah, I, I can see that, yeah. yeah. So there's a lot of a lot of components there, um, and then I mean, boy, for a hot seat segment question, these you know, if the intent was to be rapid fire, um, you know, these questions do require thought. They're thoughtful questions. Can I throw one other question at you at least? All right. Shoot. What do you consider the most important thing that you've learned in your career journey, other than don't react to every up and down on the chart? Um. 
I, I don't know about the most important thing. The, the thing that I've, I've learned or I feel is the most important thing for me recently is to try to um, take a moment before I react uh-huh. and it's kind of combined with the element of um, trying to stay, um, I don't want to say above the situation, like in a conceited way, but just removed enough from the situation where you can kind of be self-aware of everything's going on. And so you understand what are the needs of the other person in this encounter. It's not only about me. And uh, the the easiest tactical way to do that, I have found, instead of jumping to what you think is the, the answer, uh-huh. is simply to say, tell me more. Uh-huh. And uh, that that's something that Chris taught me. Um, and uh, he, I don't know if he sent it to me through a blog post or through a podcast, but then we talked about it and he would always practice it very well. And he taught me. It's such a great way. I use it in my personal life. I use it in my professional life, um, both in on the doctor side. I mean, Mm -hmm. I mentioned I was, you know, doing a night show last night and and, um, on the business side. It's it's just such a great way to learn more information, to make it about the other person or the other people in the room and to give you some time to kind of think through things. But tell me more. Yeah. That's a good problem solving technique of making sure you fully grasp the situation, that you understand the, um, that before jumping too quickly into um, you know solution mode. That that is a helpful question. Um, what about you, Mark? Well, what do you consider the most the, important? the yeah. most important thing? Um, that's that's really that's tough. An important thing. I know I'm the question is the, thing now. Yeah. the most important thing. Um, an important thing is something I think I first got introduced to an idea, maybe, you know, eight years ago, um, you know, some formal context around change. And, you know, how often do we hear or we've, have we found ourselves kind of labeling people as being, quote unquote, resistant to change? And I think you know this idea that that comes from maybe a, a couple different realms or disciplines, but um, you know this idea of like you know, pe- people don't resist change; they resist being changed. I think it's such a powerful notion, and you know, in the context of you know, there, there's a methodology called motivational interviewing. Tell That's me more about that in counseling. <laughs> Good job. Um, you know, motivational interviewing, you know, helps people through the process of change. So I think there's an important related learning is that change and people's acceptance of change or their willingness to try a change is a process. It's not as easy as flipping a light switch. And, you know, motivational interviewing teaches us that people have reasons to change and they have reasons not to change. So instead of being quote unquote resistant, it's more like they're they're stuck, or you know the the, the technical language that they use is that somebody's ambivalent to change, and and so rather than making it feel you know making it seem like that person's fault for being resistant and like mm-hmm. labeling them and giving up on them, you've really got to you know pardon the use of the word here, lean in to understand more. Somebody says oh, I don't want to do that. What question might we throw at them? Tell me more. Tell me more, right? Instead of just saying, no, you have to, and trying to force the change or get rid of somebody because they're being quote unquote resistant. I think it's, 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 it's not textbook lean thinking, but I think it's, it's a really important concept to bring into lean. And I kind of, it fits with, I, you know, to me, the description of a lean culture that engages people in a collaborative, participatory way around change and improvement and innovation. Now, there's a time and a place where a boss has got to say, for example, like, hey, you have to wear your safety glasses right. in the factory. But, you know, uh, 
you know, I think in situations where we're discussing new ways of doing things, like we're recording this podcast episode in a platform called StreamYard instead of Zoom. You know, Greg, I'll give you credit. You weren't being resistant to change when I suggested this. Yeah, no, I, I, um, I think motivation. Thank you. Uh, I, thank you. Did you did you want to finish off your thought? Because I was going to. No, take, no, no. I was, I was trying to hand it back over to you. Perfect. Yeah, no. Motivational interviewing, I think, is a great example of taking something from one discipline and then realizing the applicability because it really started from the '90s in psychological addiction work, not psychological addiction, all types of addiction, but in, in the um, psychiatric practice of helping people with their addictions. And uh, I think it's, it's so easily and um, so meaningfully is applied in in all kinds of situations. And it, it uses some of the same principles that mental modeling uses. Instead of, instead of asking a person, well, what are the reasons why you are finding it hard to change or you wouldn't want to change? Asking them and trying to get their their brain to be open to well, what are the possibilities that could happen or what are the benefits that you could see if you were to do this uh -huh. and getting them to articulate all of those um, aspects right. are far better in getting that person to you know, move the needle in something that might be really good for them. Um, and so I, I just, I just, I love the, I'm, I'm glad you brought up motion of motivational interviewing. I, I feel like we've we've had conversations about it um, m many years ago, and it hasn't been a while since you brought it up. So, yeah. and you know, asking people the reasons to do something to articulate their motivations—that's talking about the possibility, right? right? The reasons to do something instead of talking about the problem or the barriers. And I think there's some important lessons there. You're not manipulating people but getting them to articulate the reasons to change mm -hmm. helps strengthen their commitment to at least trying the change. And, and it helps personalize the potential benefits to that person. You might say, oh, well, you need to, um, we'll just pick on smoking. You know, you need to quit smoking because it's going to, um, you know, cause emphysema. And, and that person may not have any care about that, but they might say, oh, well, if I quit smoking, I'd, I'd have more money in my pocket every day. And that might be something that didn't mean much to you, but you articulated and asked for them to give a reason. And, you know, that, that could be a positive reason for them to change. That's personalizing it to them. And I think that applies so well in a continuous improvement mindset. Let's say you're a continuous improvement co coach and you are trying to teach a huddling process or you're trying to teach an A3. So Mark, what would what would be the benefits of, of huddling for, for your day? You might articulate things that never even crossed my mind. And, um, and so, um, yeah, motivational interviewing. I love it. And, and let me ask you this. On a scale of one to 10, how important do you think motivational interviewing is um, to your practice of lean? That's a very motivational interviewee question. Um, I, I would say a 10. Um, oh, well, fully committed. Fully committed. So well, the, and the, the tactical practice of that would then be, let's say, let's say Mark would have said at eight. It, a lot of times people would follow that question up with, well, why did you not pick a nine? But instead of doing that, the less obvious thing to do is say, oh, Mark, why, why did you say, why did you say an eight? And, you know, what, what led you not to say a six? Right. And now all of a sudden, Mark would articulate all the benefits of, of making yeah. that change. So. so let's say when I proposed to Greg, relatively last minute also, yeah. <laughs> but thank you for rolling with that. Um, hey, we're going to record in StreamYard. Now, like you might have thought, well, okay, I can go along with Mark. I can try it. I also don't know if I know how to use it. I don't know how it, you know, if it works as well. You could have had reasons not to try StreamYard. It's not that we were hashing through this, but you know, I, I could apply that, you know, to you. We don't need to totally role play it here. But like, hey, Greg, um, how how um, uh, 
boy, what are the, there's two questions. Um, of how important is it to you and how confident do you feel about doing it? Is that right? Yeah, or how important it would it be to you to, to try a new service like StreamYard, maybe. Yeah. That, you, you know. might have said, you know, six. And then I would say, well, why do you say six instead of two? And you might say, like, well, I know the recording quality comes out better. So that's a reason to do it. I, I don't know if that's the best case example, but thank you for not being resistant to change. <laughs> it, it, you know me, I'm always willing to try something. It didn't even, I was like, oh, cool. We're, right. we're going to get to try something new. This is great. You know? <laughs> so I didn't think I needed to give you like a, no. a whole briefing of all the reasons why. Yeah. But I apologize to what, uh, you know, what did I say earlier about forcing change on people? Sorry. Well, I think if the stakes would have been higher, like yeah, this is live at Kinexicon, I would have said, Mark, come on. Yeah. <laughs> we should have practiced this. And, but the stakes were pretty low. If it would have failed, we would have simply just. Yeah. Uh, True. And if, if you, if you had concerns and we, we could have done it through Zoom, it wasn't yeah. that big of a deal. But. I can almost guarantee Chris would have had no problem and would have been excited to yeah. have done another platform. So, you know, we, we will put in the show notes a link to the Lean Leadership podcast that Chris hosted. Um, I'll throw other links in there, um, other podcasts and videos that we did together. We, we traded off um, here in the Kinexus podcast series of me interviewing Chris, why did you join Kinexus? And then we, in a, a different episode, turned the tables where he asked me, you know, some of that story of going back to 2011, why did you join Kinexus. So we'll point people to that. And then Chris also presented a webinar when he was working at Wright Medical. He was one of our customers who did um, a, a webinar as part of that series. So we'll, we'll share that. Um, it's it's nice that we have these recordings and um, Chris is still teaching people. Yeah. I mean, with regard to his podcast, he's a quite an extensive library. I think he has over 60 episodes of some really high quality conversations. So. That's really cool. Yeah. So we'll go ahead and go ahead and wrap. That sounds good. I, I'll, I'll end it with the way Chris ended uh, m many of our chats. And he would say, I love you, brother. Mm -hmm. And um, he, that was always a very meaningful way to end things with him. So I, I'll, I'll tell you, Mark, I love you, brother. I love you, man. Cool. That's a nicer way than saying, I'll see you kind next time. It's a little more heartfelt. <laughs> yeah. Well, rest in peace, Chris. Yeah.